I Matter is a heritage lottery funded project conceived by T. Gwynne School and Forget Me Not Productions. It provided multiple opportunities for meaningful assistive technology experiences. These were interwoven with the arts, enabling local individuals with the most complex needs to share their own history and celebrate their independent achievements. Pupils at five local special schools, adults from a local day centre and three individuals, all with complex needs, took part in assistive technology and inclusive arts music can sessions. Mm. Do you want more drum? Oh, more drum! <laughs> Come on, Good girl. The project was launched in February 2020 and was due to conclude in July 2020 with the iMatter Festival. This was going to be an assistive technology training event for professionals in the fields of special education, health, and social care, and a celebration of the achievements of all involved. Due to COVID-19, the project was postponed and visits cancelled. We also had to adapt the sharing event to fit a virtual platform. Sadly, once the sessions had resumed, Trinity Field School had to pull out because they were still not allowing visitors. Ascol Henfellin stepped in at the 11th hour and had the remaining sessions, enabling us to wrap up the project only a year and a half late. What is assistive technology? For the purpose of this project, we are using the term assistive technology to include any specialist technology to enable access to a computer, such as switches, touch monitor, eye gaze, linked to specialist software for teaching cause and effect, choice making and beyond, augmentative and alternative communication, specialist controls for wheelchair driving, and access to toys and play. Assistive technology for independent living, working, lifelong learning, and leisure. One of the main aims of the project is to empower those individuals identified as experiencing profound and multiple learning disabilities through the use of assistive technology and to experience independent achievement. Play the drum. Play the drum. Play the keyboard. Ooh, and the keyboard. Another focus of iMatter has been to provide staff members with the opportunity to be trained in the implementation of assistive technology systems for those with the most complex disabilities. Hello, I'm Katie Corbin and I work in Ascot in Berlin. I've been a part of the project with Mel and Carrie, working a specialist class in Ascot in Berlin, Dos Bastere. I'm part of the communication team within YHF and Clary and Mel have been very supportive in helping me achieve my assistive technology professional development. What are the main barriers to learners being able to achieve? Finances comes into it a lot. This specialist equipment is so, so expensive. Obviously the upkeep of them because it's all of the new things coming out, software updates and stuff like that. The pandemic has had a lot to do with the finances and we do lack the specialism within assistive technology because it is such a criteria that you've got to meet and there's so few lack of opportunities out there for training in such a specialist field. So if you could have the, the training and the knowledge and develop that area, what do you think the benefits would be to this, this group of learners, to these classes. Obviously promoting their independence, promoting their well-being, the smile on their faces while they have achieved the past two weeks. Um, just really giving them that voice and the opportunity to be able to express themselves without any prompting from any other person. We hope to raise awareness of the historical development of specialist technologies and the potential impact for independent learning via new technologies 
and new techniques. The project focuses on lifelong learning and we incorporated private clients and day service users as well as school age pupils. We got to see the impact of assistive technology on day service users for whom assistive technology might not have been readily available when they were growing up. The intergenerational element allows people from all walks of life to demonstrate their own personal journeys with assistive technology. Music Can is a framework designed by Forget Me Not Productions. The Music Can protocol uses music as a motivator to engage individuals in using assistive technology. Unlocking hidden potential and self-expression. Within the framework, participants are introduced to concepts of cause and effect, turn-taking, and pre or early communication. You can choose. What would you like to play the drum? Play the drum. The drum. We will, we will rock you. What next? Do you want me to play? Play the guitar. Play the guitar. guitar. Baby, try a few. Forget Me Not Productions used the Music Can framework throughout the iMatter project. Washing line. Hey, now it's stuck. 
out. Shall we try again? again.
Dr. Carol Thornett has been involved in the field of assistive technology since 1986. She was a pioneer in exploring the use of assistive technology with individuals experiencing profound and multiple learning disabilities. In fact, it was Carol that developed the first mobility platform, which was originally part of the Spastic Society Research Project, which had the aim of enabling children with cerebral palsy to explore mobility when their peers were able to. Well, it started really with BBC computers. So, um, and we had some really quite nice software for them. You know, we had some brilliant computing things and so on. And it, it made such a difference too. It made an enormous difference. Um, everything then in those days, because we didn't really have eye gaze, I think eye gaze did come in, but it was unbelievably expensive to start off with. So, you know, we had switches to begin with. 
um, but a whole range of them. And in fact, there are still switch users today. There's somebody that I see regularly who uses a single head switch with this communication device. Um, so I started out that way originally, um, but also looking at power mobility as well. So that was how the tracking, the mobility tracking started, really. Um, with the mobility tracking, we're trying to get children mobile at the same age that their peers would be mobile. So it wasn't quite, you know, it's been um, extrapolated to those with learning difficulties and uh, physical difficulty, obviously, as well. Um, but initially, it was just a physical difficulty. Um, that proved to be really exciting, actually. Um, and I think it's quite sad now that I'm seeing so few with independent mobility. They should be in their um, usual seating because that was always such a problem if they went to a wheelchair service in that, you know, what seating would they use? So this was, you know, that, that's re the reason why it was a platform. It was so that you could attach the whole seating system, uh, which you know, could be based as well, you know, the whole thing. Um, so that you started by looking at whether they could control it and what they would do and you know, could they stop and stop it as important as going and, and so on. So uh, the reason for it being a platform um, was that, was that issue. And later on, I mean, other people have copied the platforms since then. Uh -huh. Oh, I mean, what's made a huge difference is to have eye gaze. It's made an enormous difference, particularly, to, actually, to those with more complex needs. And they're the group, I think, that it's made the biggest difference for. And, you know, there's a young lady that I see in Cornwall who uses her eye gaze amazingly well and in fact has now started um, looking at um, a, a reading, a writing program so to speak with eye gaze, you know, whereas I never imagined that she would ever do so. Yeah. And certainly not with switching. Switching was limited and I think switching programs were also very limited. Um, almost all of them were for, for children. I think we're seeing far less use of switching, but in fact, switching was lovely for very young children for toys. Mm. You know, and I recently adapted a, a singing Christmas tree. <laughs> <laughs> this is the second one I've adapted. Didn't actually. you bring it along? <laughs> <laughs> but it was great fun, and the, the, the little one who, who's yeah. using it loves it, absolutely loves it. I've got several people who would be interested if. If there was um, an eye gaze wheelchair, and I've actually built a, a simple controller that in fact worked with grid 2 rather than grid 3, but it, it did allow people to experience what it would be like to use eye gaze to control the powered wheelchair. And I did try it with one person who I've been seeing for years, and he's got very tall and also has gone very, very much over to one side as well. Um, and he did the best driving I'd seen him drive. Um, he was fantastic, and he actually asked to stop when he felt that you know it was getting too much. And I felt that that alone was was really indicative of how important that the eye gaze was to him for as a method for driving. Um, but um, I haven't looked because I would have looked at it in, in the Christmas break to see whether around the world <laughs> what, what was happening. But I know that no commercial system had been developed with eye gaze. Um, there's plenty of ones that have researched. And part of that, I think, is that people, under, people feel that it's just too easy to select, you know, because the problem with eye gaze anyway is you can select as easy as anything. You know, so you have a page of your favourite things like you might have done for switch use, which was rather different. You know, you can select all sorts of favourite things. You know, what you actually want is for those favourite things to be a clear, definite selection. A very long dwell time. Well, it, and what I've done is I've done a, a, 
a, a sort of tailor-made system for the young lady in Cornwall where the options are very well spaced and it's quite clear what she's actually going for. There's only about six or seven options on a page, something like that. And it's quite obvious that she'll keep going for chocolate, whatever <laughs> yeah. chocolate is put. But what I feel with, the, with those young people is that they're going further and further all the time. And what you desperately hope is that they'll do something at college that's not just some, um, a special um, um, curriculum for... Um, people with disabilities. Yeah. yeah, they want to do more than that and it's going to lead somewhere as well. And I think so many of us, you know, we desperately want it to lead somewhere mm. for them to be doing something that they really enjoy doing. Um, you know, I, I explained to a young lady the other day that, um, you know, she's really interested in art and you know, if she gets her GCSEs, which are English, Maths and Science, then, you know, she won't do those subjects again in college. She can focus on her art. Mm. And I think that's quite important, actually. Yeah. Um, because people have the feeling that they're just going to be doing the same thing again and again until, mm. you know, they finish, really. Yeah. They've had their college time. She ran Scope's microtechnology service for many years. These days she works independently to enable access to the curriculum and GCSE courses, which is the aim of Brad Brunt, a past pupil of Ascol Henvelin. That. Three because your computer. Oh, you used you the school used computer. One that you used in school, and you used to use um, some switches in school sometimes as well to operate the computer before we had an eye gaze in school. Yes. No, because mm. more difficult. Yeah. Teachers doing work not older for my brain. Yeah, yeah, stuff too, too, things are too easy for you, they're too, too young. Yes. And I suppose because it's primarily a school for children with learning disabilities, and, yeah. and because you don't have a learning disability, so it's geared towards mm. children who aren't as able as you. Yeah. I say more difficult and I need help sometime. Mm. You have that ability yeah. to learn. Yes. Teachers need do more difficult work for me. I can open doors myself and I don't need mad people open it. And TV. Is the door closing? So you, do you do that? Do you use that a lot, Brad? Yes. 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 Yes, but if not work, computer. Yeah, so it all, all depends on that then. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Games. Games? And remote controls. <laughs> Computers and faster. Internet. 
Internet. The historic Krieger Park School has been our heritage partner throughout the iMatter sessions. Krieger Park House is a country house situated in Penturk in Cardiff. Charles Edward Mallows built it in 1914 for a colliery owner called Thomas Evans. The garden and park surrounding the house has its own Grade 2 listing and has been designated a conservation preserved area. Krieger Park House is a large mansion with the entrance front to the north and the garden front onto which all the main reception rooms face to the south. The gardens are also listed at Grade 2. The listing record notes their strong axial design and considers them a very good example of an architectural Edwardian garden. The influence of Edwin Lutchins has been noted many times in the design of the house. Thomas Evans started his career as a railway man and he made his fortune by collecting coal that had fallen from coal trucks on the railways. He was known locally as Small Coal Evans and he later became the owner of Ocean Colliery. He had Krieger Park House made, which reputedly cost him over £100,000. Cadu Listings describes the structure of the house as built of coarse, snecked, rock-faced sandstone, quarried locally with yellow limestone dressings and tile roof with swept eaves and long narrow stacks parallel to the main ridge set across the cross tables. Charles Edward Mallows died just one year after the work on the house began. Following the death of Thomas Evans in 1943, Krieger Park came into the possession of the National Coal Board before being sold in 1954 to the Spastic Society, which opened the residential school site in 1955. The house still operates a school for children and young adults with disabilities. It is now owned by Salutum Healthcare. And over to some youngsters who deserve all our sympathy and help. The spastic children at Craigie Park School in Wales. Even if they can't run around like most children, Santa Claus hasn't forgotten them. He turns up with his sledge, his reindeer, the lot, and fully laden. Craigie Park is one of three schools set up by the National Spastic Society during the past year to provide education and treatment for badly handicapped spastic children between the ages of 5 and 16. It accommodates 35 children at present, doing everything possible to help them live normal lives. And what's a normal life without a real good Christmas? For Christmas parties and assemblies and Father Christmas. Well, they say Father Christmas used to come on that chimney as well. So yeah, we used to have Christmas parties and just general socialisation. This used to be bedrooms where the residential students would, would basically sleep if they were residential. It's, it's used for mainly storage. Mainly storage, yeah. And um, we there's like um, a teacher's rooms and there's what we call PPA rooms so that the teachers can come up and have their quiet time with a laptop and the internet or whatever it is they need to prepare the curriculum really. No students, no. Um, well, as you can, well there is, it is accessible obviously as yeah. you can see but there is safety parameters now we have to stick to. Yeah regarding, you know, lift and what people can get in and out of quickly and stuff like that. We, we use them for um, wheelchair driving and on the odd occasion, COVID permitting, we have um, garden parties and school fights and things like that. And sports then.
Hi, my name is Mel and I have specialised in the field of assistive technology for 23 years this year. Um, my first involvement with um, any form of specialist technology was at Craig Park School when I was 16 and used to volunteer there every Saturday. Um, I remember seeing people with um, Canon communicators with the that we've seen in the history section of the documentary, um, printing out the ticker tape in order to communicate, and also um, I remember seeing somebody using uh, the possum with switches um, and a head pointer on a typewriter. Um, this certainly uh, influenced my choice of career. Um, so 23 years later, I am working as an independent consultant um, in, in special schools, uh, day centres and in the medical legal field also. So uh, 23 years ago, um, teaching assistive technology to people with very complex disabilities was quite different in some respects to it is now. The only option for people without hand function was uh, using switches and it was quite a skill to set up those switches effectively and enable people to make progress using switches. I think quite an interesting, um, an, an interesting change has been the development of touchscreen technology. So going back to the early 2000s, um, a touch monitor for a computer would cost about £800 and that was just for a huge um, a, a huge monitor um, that was touch sensitive and it was very much a, uh, a sort of disability provision um, which is why it was so expensive and I remember having strategies for teaching people how to use a touch monitor um, and it was that was quite a task in itself of course, these days you you don't have to do that. Um, you know, children are introduced to touchscreen technologies at home from from tiny, quite frequently from from looking at their parents' phones to household iPads and tablets. And it's quite noticeable, I feel, that you, you no longer have to teach people that that do have a hand function, such as perhaps young people we've seen in the video, such as Hadar Ali, um, you know, young people with, with autism or a learning disability who could effectively use a touch screen. You, you don't have to teach that skill anymore, it's already there. Additionally, <clears throat> because of the development of touch screen technology, uh, prior to that time, I also used to spend a lot of time teaching people how to use alternative mouse controls. So um, if you thought somebody had the cognitive capacity to move the mouse pointer on the screen, you couldn't use a standard mouse, you might want to use a rollerball or a, or a joystick for that, um, for that task. Um, and spend a lot of time, you know, many, many months or longer, teaching someone how to move the mouse pointer on the screen and had a lot of teaching strategies to do that. But again, that's... Um, that's often not, not needed now because you just go straight to a touch screen, um, a tablet or, or, or a, a, you know, a touch sensitive laptop for example. But of course by far um, the biggest development for assistive technology, particularly for those individuals with the, with the greatest um, cognitive impairments has been the development of eye gaze. Uh, so when eye gaze first, first became um, commercially available it was really um, mostly suited for for people who were going to who were already at a level of using AAC and perhaps were using AAC with switches um, switches being very effective but slow slow and laborious um, and uh, whereas eye gaze was was a much more instant. Um, 
So, uh, so I guess worked really well for that, though, though that group of um, of people straight away. But it took some time for iGaze to be suited, a software to come out and be made available for people with more significant um, intellectual impairments um, as well as their physical disability. But once uh, software such as um, Look to Learn and Sensory Eye Effects and some, um, you know, some of the inclusive technology softwares became available for iGaze users, um, it's really opened up a whole new world um, for that group of learners, which is just um, just amazing, and you see people making making choices uh, using eye gaze who I wouldn't have considered um, who I would have considered it being very difficult to teach them to make choices using switches because using switches to make choices is a much higher cognitive load. If that makes sense. Um, yet they can do it with uh, with eye gaze. Yeah, I also work with some adults who are experiencing PDOC, so a sort of permanent disorder of consciousness, and um, due to acquired brain injury, and have absolutely no voluntary movement whatsoever, um, other than their eyes. And so, without the development of of eye gaze technology, they wouldn't. Um, they, they wouldn't have been able to access um, specialist technologies for any sort of independence at all. Yes, yeah, so Craig Park School was um, certainly one of the inspirations for my subsequent career choices and um, um, back in 1999, following my graduation, I um, set up the assistive technology department at Craig Park and um, yeah, worked there for um, eight or nine about eight to nine years, um, running the assistive technology uh, department for the school, um, which was very effective. Yes, and I think the next major development in assistive te technology will be um, the ability to drive a powered wheelchair via eye gaze. Um, it's already happening. Um, there are a number of companies in, in the UK and um, Broad, who are experimenting and exploring that as an option, and it is it is possible. People are people are doing it. Um, it's just it's not yet something that is considered safe enough, tried and tested enough for it to be um, commercially available or for it to be provided by wheelchair services. But my guess that will happen in the next I don't know what should I predict five years, um, which would be an amazing. Uh, development also. Um, in the past I have certainly considered the development of wheelchair driving using specialist controls as being a specialism of mine, um, starting with mobility platforms and uh, moving on from there and being able to to train, train children using the platforms um, so that you can then go to wheelchair services and say Yep, using this control and this piece of seating, um, they can they can drive effectively, um, and then hopefully have a wheelchair, a powered wheelchair provided by this wheelchair service. I would imagine that um, that Bradley would um, love to explore uh, wheelchair driving via eye gaze. Um, I can see him being one of the first. Don't you think, Brad? I am first. To be honest, that's not really applicable because the school I work in is catered for people with disabilities. Um, research the school you're going to work in and the students you're going to work with. And then it's just a case of getting to know your colleagues and them getting to know you. Um, and that should make your job hopefully a lot easier. That I'm probably a student, but that doesn't happen anymore because I'm older and I grow beards and stuff like that. So that tends not to happen anymore. But that was one of the first things people used to look at. And say, uh, well, my powered wheelchair for starters, it can. Well, the batteries last longer. 
which means I can stay up for longer, I can socialize for longer and be in work for longer and secondly my power chair then can also do this As you can see the chair, the chair that I'm sitting in is actually rising, which then also helps me in my job professionally when I'm working with students with standing frames, one in standing frames, sorry, and also helps me socially when there is no seating available for other people, I can then rise myself up to the level that the person is standing to. And then when I'm when I'm done, I just go back down. Um, there's no comparison because now I can turn lights on using my voice. Whereas when I was younger, I wasn't able. Well, I wasn't able to read. I wasn't able to really re reach the light switches due to them being on a different level so it's basically far different now to how it used to be Is it rain? Is it wind? Is it sunshine? On our adventure day Adventure day Who's knocking the door for me? We're going on an adventure. We're going to Kryger Park. What a beautiful day! Sunshine! Let's get ready on our way. Footsteps in the streets. Uh oh. I can hear a rumbling. Is it thunder? Have we got lightning bolts? Can you hear a rumbling? Lightning bolts. We're going on an adventure. We're going to have a good day. Tiger Park's in the distance, but oh. I can feel the wind. <gasps> it's a blizzard. A windy, windy gale force wind. Have we got more lightning, Chloe? Oh, the lightning is striking, Chloe. Oh, and it's gone, it's gone. Because I can make music with my eyes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
out because I can play music with my eyes. Wow. I watch because I can feel the music. I watch because I can play music with my eyes. I watch because I can use drums with my hands. Yeah. 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 I match because I can use beans with my hands. Yes. I match because I can play the drums with my hands. I match because I can play the guitar with my eyes. Yay. 